My name is Abby. I'm deeply passionate about all things wild and have made it my mission to document many of the world's most stunning trails, be that through day hikes or multi-day long distance walking. Each route is totally unique. Some traverse exposed moorlands and rugged mountaintops, others pass through bustling market towns and historical cities. They follow world-renowned archaeological discoveries and travel through some of the most tranquil valleys and mystical forests accessible on foot. It's not surprising then that they attract walkers from all over the world, many seeking a challenge, others looking to break free from the monotony of everyday life and be inspired by nature. My reason for hiking though is one of discovery and awareness. Getting outside is now more important than ever before, with obesity rates maintaining record highs and mental health issues affecting over one in four individuals. There are incredible landscapes all around us, but so few of us dare to venture into such seemingly inhospitable lands for fear of failure or becoming lost. Well, I'm here to show you otherwise and inspire you to don your walking boots and spend more time in the wild for the benefit of mental and physical health. I've realised that sometimes you don't have to do something crazy or radical to change how you feel about your life, you just have to walk. I face my own trials with mental ill health, as no doubt you'll see throughout my travels, but alongside building a strong support network, getting outside and taking the time to reconnect with nature has helped me move further along the road of personal discovery. So, here's me inviting you to join me on my adventures as I explore this beautiful planet. There will be challenges along the way, and we're not guaranteed to succeed, but it takes a brave heart and a courageous soul to commit to the unknown. Now all you have to do is decide that you want it more than you are afraid of it. Are you ready? Let's go. in Helmsley and that can only mean one thing. Ta-da! <laughs> We're going to be walking the Cleveland Way. This is one of the official starts. There's actually three official starts. I was hoping to start in the actual marketplace itself but there was a big old market believe it or not which is fine it's good that they're doing that um, so I've come here where it's a little bit quieter this is the National Trail Stone uh, now the Cleveland Way is a pretty much whole new trail to me um, it was designated in 1969 so it's England's second oldest trail just after the Pennine Way and it runs for 110 miles across the stunning North York Moors which is kind of like the first half and then it joins the East Coast we'll be heading south with the North Sea on our left all the way through settlements like Whitby and Robin Hood Bay and Scarborough till we reach Filey and Filey Brig and the end of this specific trail but that's pretty much it I think the next thing to do is get walking because I've got fair old mileage ahead of me today uh, I'm gonna be doing it in six days I forced myself not to do it in five I wanted to drag it out a little bit longer I've got the time the weather is reasonable it's cooler than yesterday so of course I'm happy with that and uh, that's enough chat let's get walking <laughs> The first leg along the way was an agreeable way to begin a long distance hike, as you'll see, climbing gently up and away from Helmsley and on into pastoral and arable farmland. Oh, take a big deep breath, it's official, we are on the trail. But just to give you a heads up if you are considering doing this route, it's relatively simple to leave your car at the long stay car park and just pay at the uh, castle office is £22 for a week and then basically when you finish get to Filey, train to York and then bus back to Helmsley and that's my plan as well so one thing I did just mention there was Helmsley Castle and I had the wonderful opportunity to have a look around it yesterday in the glorious sunshine. Helmsley Castle is run by English Heritage who charge a fee for entry. Although there's not a lot to see today the castle itself dates back 900 years, when it was built by Walter Esbeck, who also founded the nearby Rivu Abbey, but more on that later. There are remains of the East Tower, kitchen, pantry and buttery, but it was the English Civil War that saw the castle destroyed in 1644. 
Leaving the castle behind, I headed on along the trail, passing hedgerows and banks splashed with wildflowers like buttercups, forget-me-nots and scabiscus. These guys are going to warm me up a bit, I expect. Let's get to the top. Just trying to wait for my muscles to warm up a bit. My glutes and hamstrings are feeling quite tight. It's very different uh, carrying a weight to obviously day-to-day -day walking. Just take the obvious. So it just takes a little bit of a while to get the body warmed up and back in balance with the additional weight on your back. A little further on, and I passed the 19th century Griff Lodge, standing guard over a nearby entrance to Duncombe Park, and then dropped down to join a quiet country lane, which I followed for a mile or so. Okay, I've been following the road for about half a mile since we joined it, and we've reached this junction here. So if I was to follow this road, that would take me down to Rivu Abbey, which was founded in 1132 by 12 monks in a remote location. They wanted to be tucked away so they could practice their simple way of life, but they managed to make a great fortune by mining lead and uh, other different, you know, iron as well, other metals, but also by rearing sheep and selling their wool. So they had a good fortune, but then, of course, we all know what happened to many of the abbeys in this country. Come 1538, Henry VIII was on the scene, dissolution of the monasteries, their wealth was stripped away, and all we've got now is the remains of the abbey. But we've also got here, on this rather busy spot, see all these cars, uh, this is here, just wait for that one to go past, <laughs> Uh, this is Rivu Bridge, so it's a little clapper bridge, or pack horse bridge, sorry, over the River Rye. So we've got to go over that and we'll carry on along the trail. The limestone bridge itself is thought to date back to the 18th century and is now protected as a Grade 2 listed building. Further along the trail, with the road now behind me, I emerged to discover a beautiful wildflower meadow near Noodle Hill. There were orchids of every kind, ragged robins, clovers, and many other flowers as well. I stopped for a while to take it all in, then continued onwards, over a set of stepping stones and into the woods. Ooh, sun's coming out, feeling warm. Uh, <laughs> it is due to get to about 27 degrees today, actually. But the positive about this trail is you're never really too far from the coast. I mean, you know, realistically, we're about 50 miles away. So just about got some movement in the air as opposed to being really far inland where it would be very still, humid, sticky and sweaty today. Thankfully, there were plenty of things around me to keep my brain distracted from the heat, like the austere St Michael's Church in Cold Kirby, built in the 19th century, though still housing the front from the original 12th century building. Hey, first honesty box. Wasn't expecting this. Look, what's in there? Oh, flapjack. Nice. Don't need it, but it's cool that it's there. <laughs> Listen to those skylarks. They're really singing their hearts out. Enjoying the sunshine, huh? <laughs> you see this? That there is a deer track. I think it's probably Ro. There's another one there. Another one there. Another one there and then they just head on along the trail for a little bit. Cool spot. Sadly, the piece of nature didn't last for too long, as I soon emerged to the noisy A170, which I somehow had to safely cross. Oh, it's a busy road. <laughs> Can't get across. Okay, ready? <laughs> Man, that is a busy road. All right, goodbye, A Road. Let's get back to some quiet countryside. I'm being followed by loads of flies, but otherwise, get off, flies, get off. Otherwise, 
this is so lovely. We just emerged into this like scrubby bit. Uh, there's bilberry plants and silver birch here. Go away, flies! <laughs> and uh, flies. <laughs> but it's, it's, this is nice. It's got a kind of Scottish feel to it. What is going on, man? Come on, right, go, go, go. Help us! <laughs> Having recently passed by what was once the Hambledon Racecourse, a major horse racing venue for over 200 years, I soon reached an even more significant site, the Kilburn White Horse. Designed and financed by Thomas Taylor in 1857, this horse was inspired by the ancient chalk horses found throughout Wiltshire. As I rejoined the trail, I noted a small monument to those who'd lost their lives in the RAF during World War II. What does this say then? Ah, oh, cool. 981 feet above sea level. Oh, 20 miles away from York. We've got the Hawk Hills, Harrogate, Fountains Abbey. Oh, there's loads of cool places here. The Pennines in Great Wernside. Oh, wow. Richmond. Love that place. Coast to coast goes through there. This is a cool little thing. Love it. So I thought we'd just detour and have a quick look at the National Park Centre. It seems like a cool little place. And I, and I can't just ignore that, hang on a minute. Finest view in England, 550 metres. Okay, let's go have a look at that. Nice one. The visitor centre had a lot to offer, including a shop, interactive learning area, and a cafe. I didn't stop for too long though. Keen to see what all the signs were boasting about. The finest view in England, I had to know more. So that was the National Park Centre. I bought myself a massive flapjack, so that'll keep me going. And uh, we're back on the trail. Let's go check out the finest view in England. There's even more of these orchids here. They're just stunning and everywhere, and I love them, even with this busy road. Here we go, we're on the trail. Finest view in England. So close now. So that rather dramatic inland cliff over there, that is Sutton Bank. So the geological history within the cliff spans 60 million years. And of course it's overlooking this vast veil of land, which is the Vale of York. Interestingly, and perhaps easily overlooked, the dramatic escarpment I was about to walk along was actually once the defensive walls of an Iron Age hill fort, dating right back to 400 BC. It's one of the biggest hill forts in England, believed to have encompassed around 53 acres. What with the fine views over the Vale, though, it was easy to see why the place was chosen for a settlement. I soon entered Gorbert Wood Nature Reserve, overlooking Gormire Lake, a natural lowland lake formed around 20,000 years ago, now fed by an underground spring. Hopefully we will have left behind the majority of the crowds now, and that'll be good. <laughs> Got to chat to quite a few people, which was nice, just telling them about the project and what I'm doing, basically. And they all seemed interested, which is always enjoyable. It's so important to open up the conversation about mental health and physical health as well. Uh, and how getting outside can just really help with that. So it's nice to be able to share a little bit of the story and uh, on we go, heading on then apparently to the edge of the world. <laughs> Hi. You guys are busy having lunch, huh? Oh, look at you guys hiding in the shade. That is very sensible. Don't forget your sun cream as well. We're about 14 and a half miles in now, and I'm just approaching Higher Paradise Farm, which is very conveniently en route, and even more conveniently has a little tea shop. So I thought I might just stop here if they're open, get a brew, and then just keep pressing on for the final eight miles or so of the trail today. Over the years, High Paradise Farm has proved to be a bit of a hit with walkers on the Cleveland Way. Their tea rooms have everything a hiker would want, and they offer camping, rooms, and there's plenty of animals for company. 
Ah, oh, I'm not sure I can walk now. I'm eating so much scone. Um, but we're back on the trail now. Just gonna take it a bit slow while I digest this scone. Whew. On from the tea rooms, and I joined a dirt track, apparently used since the Bronze Age by drovers, bringing Highland and Galloway cattle down from Scotland to the York and Thirsk markets. Can't miss that sign, can you? <laughs> Which way is it? So we are now officially on Little Moor, as it is called. This big wide open space, beautifully patched with heather, uh, with the occasional sheep. <laughs> uh, and we're just gonna follow this dry stone wall now for the next hour or so. I really enjoy the presence of dry stone walls. We don't have them down in the southwest where I live. And every time I see them, I just take the time to admire their presence. I find them aesthetically pleasing to look at, but also they have a story to tell. You know, when was the earliest stretch of that wall constructed? And knowing that it takes such skill, such craftsmanship, the labor and the time and the effort and the patience it takes to build these walls. There are thousands and thousands of miles of dry stone walls all across the country, and they definitely deserve to have the time taken over them just to enjoy their presence. Oz Motherly, five miles. Making good progress. Hi. Hi. Now the drovers, as they were walking along this stretch of road with their cattle on their long journey down south to the markets, would have had to stop somewhere. And this was one of those places. So we have this slab here, which states that this is the site of the Lime Kiln House Inn. So this, this was it. This was one of the main places where the drovers would stop for the night. They'd lay over, refresh themselves, spend some time in good company, probably have a drink or two before pressing on along the trail down to the nearest market. And what a place it is, very atmospheric. And you can imagine they'd be grateful for the comfort, perhaps after a few days of walking through the mist. But then again, these men were very hardy. They were self-sufficient. They would live off oat cakes and other forms of a simple stodgy carbohydrates that they could eat on the trail but they were well fueled and they were absolutely made for their journeys along these droving roads. It was wonderful to walk along such a historic route and I lost myself in an imaginary ambience of drovers and their cattle walking the trail all those years ago. Still, archaeology isn't the only thing the Moors are famous for. I can't quite believe this I was just wandering along the path, obviously, because that's what I need to do, and I've stumbled upon this. Now, this is a, a rock, yes, but it's basically a fossil. It's two shells that seem to be sort of interlinked here, and it's a bit quartzy, a little bit shiny, it's catching the sun. I just can't believe I found this. And that's opened the door for me to have a little bit more of a discussion about geology. Now, I'm not a geologist, but I know that the National Park here, the North York Moors National Park, has been formed over 200 million years. And this place is famous for its dinosaur footprints and its fossils. Now, I wasn't really expecting to find anything until I hit the coast, where I was hoping to find some jet, because it's famous for its jet, uh, various stretches there. But I mean, this is just a wonderful thing to find, and I'll treasure this for a long time. What it does mean is I'm going to have to carry it for the next hundred odd miles. Never mind. <laughs> oh, look, another one. Wow, another fossil. That is incredible. I can't quite believe this. I'm just finding complete fossils here on the North York Moors. I missed the heather. Incredible, absolutely incredible. A mile or so later, and I had the privilege of spotting a red grouse, almost completely camouflaged amongst the heather, save for the red stripe above its eye. Nearby was a lapwing, calling out to chicks, likely nesting close by. Ta da Two miles to go. That is achievable. Let's do it. This is just great. Beautiful afternoon light as the sun slowly sets and we've got views down over Oakdale Upper Reservoir. 
Oakdale. Sounds like it should be out of the Shire on Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit or something. <laughs> All right, here we are on the outskirts of Oz Motherly. We have made it and we're just gonna head to the campsite to finish up the day. But I've just been reflecting on the journey and oh my word, how this route has surpassed anything I imagined it could give. I mean, we started with a castle, then we had a 12th century abbey, then we had the white horse, then we had the finest view in England over Sutton Bank, then we hit the moors with the heather and the curlews and the dry stone walls and the fossils. Good memories, good journey. Although small, Oz Motherly had plenty to offer, including several pubs, a village store, and what's believed to be the oldest practicing Methodist church in Britain. That evening, I stayed at the Coatgill camping site, next to an old mill, which is now used as accommodation by the Youth Hostel Association. Well, here we are on the second day of the Cleveland Way. The sun is shining. I've already got a bit of a sweat on. You know, it's going to be a good one. Uh, so today then we got another long one, which is great because the weather's going to be good and there's some really amazing scenery and we're going to be going up and down quite a lot today, as you'll see. Just want to show you this tree. It's quite big. And check out its trunk. It's all like twisted. Wow, amazing old oak tree. Keep growing, mate, you're cool. <laughs> wow. Squeeze. <laughs> there we go. Oh no. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> right, now that we've made it through the gate, this is it. We're entering into the Arncliff Wood and oh, happy space, happy space, coast to coast sign. Oh, I can hug you. Oh, I think I just put my face in bird poo. <laughs> so the uh, Wainwrights coast to coast then comes up through the woods here. And uh, trust me, it is a bit of a slob to be honest, coming up from Ingleby. And this is where the coast to coast joint, uh, the Cleveland Way, sorry, joins it. Game on. So we are in for military territory now. Uh, we're gonna head up here just for a little bit. I'm sure there's some bilberry bushes, if I remember rightly. So we might have a second breakfast <laughs> and then we'll push on onto the moors. Love this stretch. <laughs> there's not quite so many bilberries up here, actually. Um, and what there is about, they're not quite ready but despite being sharp they're bilberries and they're good this place looks interesting some kind of like radio thing or something i don't know that's not my area of expertise <laughs> now this is the kind of gate that we like look look hang on let's just take this time to appreciate the gate. Space, one can manoeuvre rather swiftly and joyfully and then you just step out. That's the kind of gate that we like. <laughs> and here we enter Scarf Wood Moor into the little bit of mist we go. Look, it's already rising. This will be great. It's going to go. Go away, mist. You can see how the rangers have put down these slabs all over the path or all along the path and they stretch on and on and basically these just help to prevent erosion of the natural soil layer so with all the people coming up and down this track whether on foot or on bikes and dogs and just all the different people um, this helps to basically just protect the environment for generations to come so definitely if there are stones about make sure you walk on them because they're obviously a lot more hard wearing than the natural soil layer from here, the path undulated in a trend that would continue for the entire day, traversing a chain of moors separated by steep wooded valleys. 
This leg was also part of the Lyke Wake Walk, a 40 mile hike to Ravenscar. Love this little wagon thing. It's just full of firewood. <laughs> it's really cool. Legs are feeling tight actually. Still those hamstrings and glutes. I need to do some stretches. Maybe not right now, they'll probably roll down the hill. <laughs> Welcome to Raysdale Estate. Once again, open access land, pure freedom. And that is so beautiful. Now one thing you guys might have been wondering is Cleveland. Why is this route called the Cleveland Way? Who is Cleveland? What is Cleveland? Where is Cleveland? Well, to answer that question, basically Cleveland, the word, originates from the old Norse word, cliff land. When the Vikings came in and they saw these vast escarpments not dropping off into the ocean but onto the land, of course these looked like coastal cliffs, so logically they called it Cliffland, and that's where Cleveland comes from. But as we've seen along the trail, there's been a huge number of historical sites, and actually where I'm stood right here, right now, this is a, um, a, the site of an old Iron Age hill fort. And if I just turn around here, this is a rather large Bronze Age burial mound, so dating to around 2000 BC. And oh my word, this character must have been hugely significant because this is an immensely prominent point in the landscape. I mean, 360 views all around. Only someone of real high status could land themselves a burial mound here because all the tribes and people living and working in the surrounding landscape could look up and they could see this burial mound and they could remember this individual. Here's a bit of heather. So can you imagine this whole expanse just painted purple? I mean, that is what dreams are made of. <laughs> I'm so glad I have my sunglasses on right now. There's millipedes everywhere. And I just accidentally trod on one and just burst into tears. Uh, so I'm really watching my footing because that was horrible and I'm still feeling a bit of horribleness. I don't want to kill millipedes. No. Continuing onwards, I pass by a weather station, which looks surprisingly fragile given the area's notoriously bad weather, before reaching a trig point at 408 metres, the highest point of Carlton Moor itself. As expected, the views were fantastic. So we are heading down now and then we'll be going back up and then down and then back up and then down and then back up and that's pretty much how the day is going to go. It makes for a certainly, shall we say, engaging but definitely challenging walk today. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's good. It keeps you going. You've got you've to keep going, really. I only had one thing on my mind at this point and that was Lordstone's, a restaurant come cafe tucked away amongst the hills. A real treat. For hungry hikers. I have emerged into the Sahara, it feels like. It's so hot. <laughs> Literally, like just standing still makes me sweat. Um, and now we've got some work to do. I want to go that way in the shade. <laughs> oh, all right. I'm going. <laughs> I paced the climb with small steps, doing my best not to overheat, keen to reach the top, the highest point of Kringle Moor. So this is the reward for the first climb. We've actually reached the second highest point on the trail and it's pretty epic up here. Still very hazy, so we can't see quite as far as perhaps you could on a clearer day, just to state the obvious there. But uh, we've got here the Alec Falconer seat. Now we'll Demo it for you. Oh, there we go. What a spot. Eventually I got myself moving again and looking ahead, I could really see why the area was coined Cliffland by the Vikings. 
an endless ridge as far as the eye could see, undulating up and down mercilessly. Just stopped for a second, decided I need to put some sun cream on. Uh, yeah, I think I've left it a bit late to be honest. Check it out <laughs> and then show you the difference. Ouchie. I mean, I laugh, but that's not really very good, is it, to be honest? So, never mind. All in a day's work. I'll learn from that and not repeat it in the future. It's worth noting that alongside the undulating route is a path that follows along below, making for an easier walk in terms of terrain, but a little trickier to navigate. That fact made little difference to me though. The way said up, so up I went. Literally every part of me is sweating right now. My hands and my fingers, even my hair. My tube is sweating. Everything is sweaty. <laughs> It's so, so warm. What a day to be doing this trek. <laughs> oh. Whew. All right, that's climb number two. Oh. It's really not that it's challenging terrain. It's just the heat, I think, drains you of energy. We've got a bit of a breeze up here though, so. I'll lap up that luxury. <laughs> the high ground was short-lived, and sure enough, I quickly began descending, overlooking the next climb, which boasted a collection of rocks known locally as the Wayne Stones. <whistles> Upon reaching the stones, I found it easy to see why they were popular with climbers a jumble of rocks pointing heavenward at random angles. Great for climbers, yes, but not so good for a backpacker like myself. It was a little tricky going. God, these guys definitely present a good little adventure. <laughs> Just weaving around the rocks, trying to take on the path of least resistance. Oh, gosh. <sighs> Come on. Oh, we made it. Oh, we made it. Okay, we're at the top of the Wayne Stones. Is that where we are? Yeah, that's where we are. Okay. The next leg took me down to a road at Claybank Top, where many walkers stop for the day. For me though, it was one last climb up to Ura Moor and the final high point for the day. Pretty pleased to be in this spot now. That means we've got most of the climbing behind us. I mean, we still got some undulation, but it's nothing like that. That's some of the toughest on the whole stretch of the trail. So that's a big tick in the box. And up here, we've got this breeze. Hopefully you can hear me okay. And we've got big views along the track that we're gonna be following for most of the rest of the afternoon. As I walked, I couldn't help but note the abundance of standing stones, presumably acting as boundary markers, though clearly some were very ancient indeed. Wow, check this out. So this big hole here is likely to have been formed by one single stone, or potentially a number of stones that could have been stuck in it, and with the wind they just keep swirling and swirling and swirling and swirling until we get this eroded circle here in this jolly great rock. Nature is amazing. After a few miles, I reached a monumental spot, the trig point marking 454 metres above sea level, the highest point on the moors and of the Cleveland Way itself. Come across this heavenly pool of water just by the side of the trail. I'd like to jump in that, but I'm not going to. <laughs> The trail could at point seem boring to the untrained eye, but looking down, I noted markings of railway sleepers. 
I was in fact following the old Rosedale Ironstone Railway, opened in 1861 to transport iron ore deposits to the surrounding industrial towns. It was here though that I reached Blowworth Crossing and said goodbye to the Coast to Coast Trail by heading north rather than east. Interestingly, there was a large boundary marker, around eight feet tall, standing alongside the way, and the remains of the Jenny Bradley Cross, a Christian cross dating to the 14th or 15th century AD. So you can see now that we're sort of skirting round the ridge that we were following earlier today. So that's just over here and we've kind of done like a U shape, like a, I don't know, shape of a horseshoe or something. But it seems to just be permanently that my left arm is getting just blazed by the sun. It's so, so sore. Uh, even with sun creep, although I definitely put that on too late in the story. I passed someone earlier and they said it got to 33 degrees today, or it was due to get to 33, so I don't know if it did or not, but it's felt like it. That's quite warm, isn't it? At least we've had this breeze, it's taking the edge off just slightly. The last leg for the day would take me along a quiet road to the outskirts of Kildale, where I was due to camp for the night at Park Farm Camping. Private grid to be used at own risk. All right then. This is where it collapses on me, isn't it? We made it. Woo! <laughs> okay, last couple hundred meters and then we're there. I've just got to get some water. That was tough, but the body's amazing. Mine's amazing. It bounces back quickly. So if I can just look after myself well this evening, then I have no doubt we'll be in ship shape, ready for tomorrow, day three on the Cleveland Way. Tonight I have mashed potato, which I've already scoffed one bowl of. It's good stuff, herby and cheesy. And I'm just utilizing this very wonky bench to do some writing. I always write in the evening. This has got the West Highland Way in, the <coughs> um, Gritstone Trail, Great Glen Way. Didn't get the coast to coast in that because I filled up a whole book for that. But now it has the Cleveland Way as well. <laughs> morning guys uh it's about 20 past six just in the process of packing up it's real windy out there it's sunny but windy so um i'm just filming this in here we've got 15 miles today last stretch of inland walking to saltburn by the sea by the sea is the key word we're going to be swapping our inland cliffs for coastal cliffs um, and then the next three days will be coastal walking despite being windy it was yet again another warm morning as i packed up in the sunshine and then headed out to kildale a small village i almost missed as it was so quiet On the other side of Kildale, the trail passed under the railway line and then began to steeply climb alongside Bankside Farm before reaching Pale End Plantation. Here we are, we're leaving the road and heading uh, through the woods actually on this nice obvious track. Happy days. This was the beginning of Easeby Moor, a collection of deciduous and evergreen trees with patches of cleared ground, now playing host to striking pink foxgloves reaching heavenwards in their pride. Wow, look at how these guys have been uprooted. See, pines have shallow roots, so in strong winds they can go over like this and just leaves huge slabs of earth. Wow. I literally can't tell you how happy I am right now. This place is so beautiful. And I'm munching bilberries because I don't want to go up this hill. So I'm procrastinating <laughs> by getting some vitamins in me and utilizing the pure gift of nature to provide me with food. But it's just silence. And silence is one of my favorite sounds, uh, especially when there's just like a gentle breeze and you know that you're just in a a beautiful natural space. I 
and there looming ahead of us is the Captain Cook Monument built in 1827 by Robert Campion. Captain James Cook was born in 1728 near Middlesbrough and would often climb the nearby Rosebury Topping. It was perhaps on the summit of the topping that James developed his yearning for the sea, later joining the Royal Navy and becoming a captain. He is noted across the country for having developed the first accurate maps of the Pacific. We are arriving at Gribdale Gate Car Park, so we're just going to cross over and then basically head up and over this little hill. Wow, check this out. Not far from the monument is a plaque commemorating the Lockheed Hudson from Fornaby Aerodrome, which crashed there in 1940 due to ice forming on its wings. There is only one survivor from the crew of four. Gosh. The way led me up and over Ayton Moor, a wide open space with clear paths and on towards Rosebury Topping. Hi. The trail itself doesn't actually go over the topping, but instead turns east. Yet a climb up to the summit at 320 metres was an absolute must. <laughs> and here it is, the top of Rosemary Topping with Sean the Sheep. <laughs> we made it. Oh, and we can see all the way that we travelled yesterday, right the way round. And as I noticed on the way up, we can see the sea. Amazing. It was pretty fresh on the summit, so I didn't hang around for too long. Soon retracing my steps back up to the way. Right, we're back where we left off. Cleveland Way. Come on, let's go. It really is exciting being able to see the sea. When I first saw it earlier, I was a bit like, wait, what? The land just stops and then I was, oh yeah, ocean, yeah, North Sea. So that's where we're aiming for today. Hi, uh, hi. Hi. Yeah. Yeah, hi. Hi. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hello, have you come to say hi? Oh, you're a bit cute. <laughs> right, I'm just going off piste a second because I want to show you something. So you see this like scrubland here and you can see how there's old stumps of trees in it. So basically this area has been clear felled at some point, probably a few years ago, and they've left all of the broken pieces of wood from the trees, all the dead wood here just lying around. And now what we can see is the different layers of succession and how the land is now, you know, got these small shrubs, all these pioneer species coming through with the heather and the birch and the smaller pines. So this is a transition and then a few years from now it will be even taller and it just shows how whilst this land is wild it is managed and by leaving the dead wood that kind of helps all of these species to sort of take root it provides the nutrients in the soil and it just allows this land to be rejuvenated i find it so interesting that you know we're not just walking through a barren landscape it's ever changing it's ever growing in fact It wasn't long before I was once again alone on the moors, turning east to follow a path of flagstones, some of which were recycled commemorative stones from a local school. It really could have been a little eerie to anyone unfamiliar with the landscape, but the shrill cry of a curlew brought me some comfort, and the odd splash of heather reminded me that this was an ever-changing landscape. So what we're doing now is we're just going to head up to the top of High Cliff Nab and then we start to descend for, for at least an hour I think, which will be good because we haven't done much downhill today. High Cliff Nab is a spectacular rocky outcrop where, rather interestingly, I noted the mountain rescue were practicing abseil exercises. It was exceptionally windy here however, so I kept moving soon rounding the brow of the hill to reveal views over the sprawling settlement of Gisborough.
you know I love backpacking and I love that I can come out here and make these films but I often feel like I'm not portraying the truth because it's so difficult to truly capture what it's like to be immersed in this 3D experience as you're walking and sometimes it's the little things that I'm not able to film very well because I have to keep moving and getting down on my hands and knees with a massive backpack is uh, it's a bit of a situation so it's things like bees just nestling on the top of thistle tops and butterflies exploring the berries on the bilberry bushes and it's the the occasional orchid that pops up or a splash of heather the color in the bank and it's even the new shoots of the trees i mean there's so much even the sky is so changing with the clouds rushing by and the sun one minute is bathing the landscape in this warm layer and you can only really experience that moment by moment by being in these landscapes by having your feet touch the ground and having your eyes open to the landscape around you breathing in that air and really immersing yourself in these places just taking the time every so often to go there and remind yourself of what it is to be grounded and connected with the natural world remembering that we are not separate but we are part of this big cycle that we call life and actually i've just been again reflecting on that i'm stronger than i think thought that i've had over the last couple of days and i've been thinking about wildflowers and how throughout the winter their seeds are buried underneath the ground and it's cold and dark throughout those months and sometimes there's even snow but as the weather starts to warm up they send a shoot up towards the surface and it starts to get taller and taller and then summer comes and boom it bursts through the surface in full display and it is proud of what it is and I want to be like that I really want to come to these places and be able to blossom and bloom just like those wildflowers and know that throughout the darker seasons the darker times the challenging times that I'm also growing through those as well. Feeling inspired I pressed on first through Springwood and then Gisborough Woods. Within the woods itself however I trod with caution as the path crisscrossed with a motorbike dirt bike club and they actually had a few pretty close calls. Oh, we'll be lucky if we fit through here. Huh. Come on. Oh. There's so many of these. They're not great. Here we go. Heading down to the road now. Let's try not to get run over. God, this road is busy. It's always fun coming out of the wilderness onto a main road. Skelton Green, two miles. It didn't take long for the noise of the road to be left behind as I climbed up through the trees and on to open arable farmland with wheat wisping gently in the wind. So this hill is called Airy Hill and it's easy to see why and we've got vast panoramas all around and it is a little bit breezy <laughs> watch this here then skeleton in view ah oh, cool this magnificent vista reveals the history of the area from its early medieval oranges through its industrial past to the present day. Fantastic. Wow. From the viewpoint, I could see across to Skelton Castle, a grand country house that was built to replace a medieval castle in the 1700s. Oh, how nice are these gardens? All the flowers, beautiful. We are in Skelton. It's a bit windy here, but it's all good. A um, little bit nervous because I always, always, always get confused in urban areas when it comes to navigating. So I'm hoping this is straightforward. And so long as I keep heading to the sea, I don't think I can go wrong. Thankfully, the path through Skelton had lots to keep me engaged including road names hinting to bodies of water in the Lake District, 
such as Derwent Road and Windermere Drive. Continuing on along the trail, I ducked under the A174 and then once again reached open farmland. dark in here. Oh, hang on. Oh, that's better. I can see now. <laughs> We've got this big field of sweet peas here. <laughs> They're not quite ready, but soon the farmer will be harvesting. A bit further on, and the trail descended to Skelton Beck. It was a lovely part of the day's walk, though upon crossing the water, I found myself completely taken aback by a magnificent feat of engineering. Oh my goodness me. This was the Saltburn Viaduct. With 11 arches, it was built between 1865 and 1872 by the North Eastern Railway Company to serve local limestone mines. From the viaduct followed a pleasant walk through Saltburn Woods before entering the edge of the village itself, where I just so happened to pass a grandstand where a band were playing out some music. After finding my B&B for the night, which I had booked since there were no campsites in the area, I headed out for a look around. I first passed a sculpture of Henry Pease, who oversaw much of the development of Saltburn, including the Valley Gardens, Pier and Cliff Lift. A little later on, and I nestled up on a bench, soaking up the fantastic coastal views as the sun set over the horizon, and readying myself for the brand new chapter that was about to follow along the coast. Morning, morning. Welcome to day four on the Cleveland Way. Can't believe it's day four already. It feels weird to be saying that. Uh, we have three days of coastal walking ahead of us. And today is the first of that and they're going to take us to finally bringing the end of the trail. Um, today though, let's not get carried away. We've got 16 miles heading to a place called Lythe, which is about one mile inland from a small place called Sands End. So that's what we're aiming for. Plenty of coastal undulation, lots of amazing scenery. And we got a good old sea breeze as well to keep us awake. Let's go see what we can find today. Here we go. Skinning Grove, three and a half miles. And I told you there was some undulation. <laughs> All right, let's do this thing. Wake up legs, we're climbing. Here we go, this will break down some of what I'm excited about today. So we're walking through a nature reserve and we will be on and off today. It's an important part of the nationally important heritage coast, which has the almost unique combination of geology, height and wildlife. The cliffs along this stretch of the Cleveland coast are amongst the highest in England. And we actually go over the highest point on the east coast. I think today, if not today, then definitely tomorrow. Personally, I find knowing a little bit about the wildlife or the archeology, span or the geology or something that perhaps interests you uh, within the area that you might be walking in just helps to immerse you in the experience on a whole nother level. It uh, means you've got your eyes open for things and rather than just mindlessly walking through enjoying the landscape, which sure there's a time and place for that, you uh, just get this greater sense of connection with the lands that you're walking through. A little further on, and I found myself feeling heartbroken as I approached a row of flowers and Samaritan signs, and plaques offering hope to those who felt hopeless. The area is a well-known suicide spot, and I felt sick to my stomach with the pain that these individuals must have been feeling, a pain that I knew way too well. I ended up curled on the ground crying and praying that no more lives would be lost anytime soon. When I eventually got moving again, I was grateful for the wind, which although made filming hard, blew away my sadness and sorrow and lifted my head once again to the beauty around me. We've just come off the path for a moment, coaster to the cliffs. 
And we've got this sculpture here. This is called Pillar. Now this is one of Richard Farrington's uh, designs. He put a load on the coast in 1990. And this is just one of them representing the four elements for him uh, of the universe. So we've got the sky, we've got the earth, we've got the sea, and we've got the air. It's quite cool, huh? A short while later, and I reached the iconic circle sculpture, another of Richard Farrington's creations. The design resembles a charm bracelet, with each of the ten charms representing something of significance in the local area. It really did feel like a monumental moment to reach it. What does this say? Extracting iron from stone. The prominent remains of Giebel Fan House provide a lasting reminder of the ironstone mining that was once a major industry in Cleveland and North Yorkshire. It was astonishing how many historical sites there were along the stretch of coastline, from Roman signal towers to limestone mines. There were plenty of wildflowers too, like vetch, cranesbill and speedwell. Soon though, I was dropping down to the sandy beaches of Skinning Grove. Check out this stuff underneath my feet. Sand! Which is really awkward for me because it gives me the heebie-jeebies. <laughs> so, so I'm not enjoying this. It just like... It sends like shivers up my spine. <laughs> Okay, we're going down in three, two, one. Woo! Oh, sandy boots, sandy boots, sandy boots, sandy boots. Oh, this is not the life. <laughs> nearly there. Come on, solid ground. I'm nearly there. Oh, this will do. I'll just stay here. Oh. My guidebook calls Skinning Grove scruffy and a bit run down, but to me it was a humble fishing village, marked even more so by the Reaper sculpture, celebrating traditional fishing techniques used throughout history in the area. Look, can you see all that? Look at that sand! I don't want that in my shoe. Oh no, it just went back in that one. <laughs> just before leaving the village, the way passed a sculpture of a pigeon fancier, which has been a popular sport in the area for over a hundred years. Right, it's time to take on a beast of a climb now. We've got to work our way back up to the top of the cliffs, but it is like a serious ascent. It's the steepest and longest one for today. So we'll take it steady and enjoy it, actually. It's always good to get the heart rate up. The climb was one of the longest on the entire trail, but the effort it required was totally worth it. I soon found myself passing a sign marking old alum quarries, and then was surrounded by striking heather. I just loved every moment of this stretch, except for the wind, which was relentless and really quite annoying. That backdrop is absolutely stunning. It is incredible up here now that we've reached the top. And we're just gonna undulate along. And the next settlement is State, which is about three miles away now. We're making good progress. That'll be just over eight miles in, I believe, for today. So roughly halfway. For the first time, I was able to see the remains of alum quarries with huge slag heaps tumbling down into the sea and stonework still standing, albeit a bit decaying and damaged. I marvelled that our heritage was so clearly visible throughout the country. I nearly walked right past that. The trig point just over there, peering over the brow of the hill, that marks the highest point on the east coast, 203 metres above sea level. We're just on the outskirts of Bowlby, which is one mile back from Staves, so we're so nearly at Staves now. Uh, I'm really, really keen to get there because I've got serious pack pain. Um, my left trap, so the top of my 
left back. I have an injury there. Uh, I've never met a professional, knows what's going on. I've had MRIs and it is just absolute agony right now. Uh, that's why I always have something around my waist is because it's just keeping the pack up. Um, but anyway, just want to get to staves now and can sort myself out. But this is a really pretty place. It looks quite industrial over there though. There's some big chimneys pumping something out into the atmosphere. Try not to breathe too deeply. This was the surface works of Bowlby Potash Mine. Potash is commonly used as an agricultural fertiliser, providing a source of magnesium, potassium, calcium and sulphur. I only gawped for a short while though, and was soon heading on along the trail and dropping down into staves. 25%! We're going down! Oh wow, I wasn't expecting that. It's like there's half a village up there, and there's this whole other place tucked away in the side of the cliff. Historically, Staithes was a fishing village, where, at the turn of the 20th century, there were over 80 full-time fishing boats. Nowadays, the village acts more as a tourist destination, though fishing is very much still a part of the culture and community. Its main street boasted colourful terraces with seaside names, but perhaps the biggest claim to fame of the area is Captain Cook. There's even a Captain Cook and Staves Heritage Centre up on the hill. I decided to bypass that though, as I'd already seen plenty of statues of the man. Here we go then, so heading back up the cliffs to the top and then we'll work on to Port Mulgrave as the next place. Uh, I've got my waist belt thing on and it has just made the world a difference uh, to how I'm feeling in my body. So we're going to hopefully be able to bound along like a spring chicken. Or is it a spring lamb? Leaving staves behind, I began the long climb up Beacon Hill and on towards Port Mulgrave. The trouble with coastal path walking is you just want to look at the views in both directions. So you're trying to walk forwards, but you keep looking backwards. And uh, <laughs> it just means I keep tripping up. And I'm going quite slowly because I just keep looking back. Um, but this stretch of coastline is just really exhilarating. You round every corner to a brand new view, some other historical place or monument. It's fantastic. <laughs> Just like that, look. Amazing. I was now looking down over Runswick Bank Top, often described as one of Yorkshire's best kept secrets. Here we go, so we're gonna descend down into the bay now. Wow, look at that water. Absolutely deep, deep turquoise blue. I felt somewhat endangered as I walked down to the bay, tempted to buy a massive ice cream and collapse in the shade. Still, the trail was cooling, and I was grateful that I listened, since the tide was coming in, rapidly making my route inaccessible. The only way forward? I had to climb some boulders. <laughs> You're doing good, doing good. At least this is granite. It's nice and grippy. I can honestly say I did not realise this was part of the plan. So we're walking across the beach, which I managed to get onto without getting wet feet. And I need to try and find the path that cuts back up the cliff. But I literally can't see it for the life of me, so this could be interesting. You need to turn right into the second break or gully in the cliffs past the prominent blue hut. So that must be that one there. At the time of research, there was no sign pointing out the correct path, but after 50 meters, you'll come to a wooden bridge across the stream you've been following from where you climb up the steep steps to High Cliff. Okay, so let's get to that gully. Okay, there better be some steps around here. Yes, steps! Whew. I'll take them any day. Solid ground. <coughs> so we literally just go up this gully. That is bizarre, man. Oh, there is a sign. That's useful. 
up the waterfall we go. Nice one. This is bananas. Whoa. Check it out, man. This is incredible. It's like a little smuggler's cove. Wow. You know, I really thought it was joking on the map where it said, if it's high tide, you'll just have to wait. But it's serious. The tide, like, if it's in, you can't cross that beach. That is just insane. A little bit of shock here. Anyway, it wasn't in, and we're still on schedule. Well, a little bit behind, but hey, what's the schedule for anyway? Woo! The climb to the top of High Cliff was long and arduous in the heat, so I took it slowly, making sure to pace myself and stay hydrated. So grateful for the shade right now. It is getting seriously hot. Sun's blazing down on us. I'm still a little stunned as well by the whole experience. That's the kind of thing you get on the Cornish coastal path, not the Cleveland Way. Honestly, I thought it was a humble trail. Oh man, heat. Whew. Is this the top yet? <laughs> North Sea Coastal Path. Is that what we're on, are we? Oh, I didn't know that. Wow. We're just going around the edge of Kettle Ness. I'm sure we're gonna have epic views of the whole cove pretty soon behind us. Uh, we've got more quarrying going on. There's so much on this trail. My mind is blown. My final few miles along the coast for the day were somewhat level, which definitely made for a change. As the skies threatened to downpour and I reached my turning off point, I passed a little sign stating the fulfilling fact that I'd walked 75 miles and had only 35 miles ahead of me to Filey. All right, this is the moment. We have the sign. Here we go, live. That's where we're going. And I like how these signs have like, there's a cafe, there's food, and there's a pub. And you have to walk there. This is my kind of language. <laughs> so anyway, we'll wave goodbye to the coast. Goodbye. And we'll pick it up again tomorrow. It's been a good day. All right, let's do it. <laughs> Live was only around a mile off the trail, which I reached via faint farmland paths. I emerged onto the road heading into the village by St Oswald's Church, claiming to have an internationally renowned collection of Anglo-Scandinavian carved stones. My campsite, live caravan and camping, was just up the road. Hello, please may I camp here? Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, this is a nice campsite, it's real quiet. Number 15 looks appealing. And with that, I pitched up and settled in for the night, hanging out with the locals as the evening drew closer. It's happening. Day f flip, what day is it? Five! <laughs> Penultimate day on the trail. I can't quite believe it. it. Does not feel like we've been walking for over four days. Feels like I've pretty much only just started the trail. Felt good this morning when I woke up. Just a bit slow packing up, so I'm a bit uh, later setting out than normal. But that was just because I was also looking at the map and I actually can't work out how far I have today. It's either 14 miles on the trail or for some reason I wrote 18. Um, I think it's probably realistically about 15 and then I've got my mile and a quarter back to the trail where we left it yesterday so that's the first task rejoin the trail
All right, and just like that, here we are. This is the point that we left before. Those uh, coastal views are looking even more stunning today, actually. And of course, we're in the breeze a little bit now. So uh, we'll work with that today. It's not due to be as strong as yesterday, so that'll be good. I can stay on my feet. Oh no. <laughs> oh, you gotta laugh. So we're back in the wooded valley, just a bit further down. So we've got to go down and then back up. Ah, all right, let's go. <laughs> Oh wow, look, we've uh, reached this old railway line. Oh, I wasn't expecting that. The beauty of disused railway lines is that they make for flat walking, and this one was no exception. A bit further on, and I passed by more old quarries, the land looking raw and exposed, scarred by mankind. There were views here though, over Sam's End, my next destination. To me, Sam's End simply appeared to be a long road of buildings facing out to sea, with a stretch of beach separating the two. The road running alongside, however, definitely reduced the appeal, as it was really busy. From here followed the longest stretch of road walking along the way, about 20 minutes into Whitby, passing a golf course and a rather interesting looking bridge. <laughs> Danger from golf balls. Watch out, folks. <laughs> It's a long old walk along this footpath into Whitby itself, or kind of the main centre. But it's just lovely being above the beach and hearing the waves and seeing everyone running around in the sand. It's got good vibes. As the path filtered into the settlement, I passed an open air swimming pool, and then another nod to Captain Cook, who moved to Whitby from Staves before joining the Royal Navy. From the statue, I could see across to the famous Whitby Abbey, but more on that later. I walked down to the coast, excited to see what I would make of one of the busiest fishing ports on this stretch of coastline. So this is the River Esk, and Whitby sits on either side. Of course, we've got the Abbey right up there. So I'm just gonna head to the station because I seem to remember there being a supermarket there, but I'm just really enjoying the seaside ambience. <laughs> It was literally moments later that disaster struck. I couldn't believe what had happened. Okay, a bit of a situation. I'm filming on my phone because my GoPro is down there in the ocean. Everything I've just filmed is in the ocean. I frantically scanned the water below. It was gone, lost from sight, and I had no idea how to get it back. I felt panic grab at my throat, but sought to think practically, rather than crumple at the feet of fear. I've got to find somebody. Right, where am I? I am outside of Proper Pastry Co. There's got to be a scuba dive around here somewhere. Oh, flip, don't panic, don't panic, don't panic. I asked a friendly local for guidance, and they suggested I speak to the RNLI. So that's where I went, with my full backpack in tow. Um, so, no, and, and we haven't got the capability to actually get to the bottom, you know. Yeah, the only thing would be to do would be to maybe ask somebody on the fish key or something like that, because I know sometimes if a boat's gone out to sea and it's got like a rope caught and it's propelling yeah. and things, we often go and tow them back in and they'll get a local diver to come and, okay. and, and cut it all free and everything, you know. Okay. It's not looking good. There's no dive club, the RNLA can't, RNL, whatever they are, they can't help. So I've got to go find some fishermen and see if they know of a diver who might be able to come and help me today. There's nobody about at all. Let's try and get some attention from someone. Nobody. Oh, come on. Do you guys know any of the local fishermen? Or are you fishermen? We're not. Why? I know. Do you know any divers, Ken? Lady here who's dropped a camera wants somebody to fish it out. 
Yeah, is that all right? Yeah. Okay, so should I even leave my number yeah, in there? So there's nobody around till five, and it'll be high tide then, but at least there's people who can help. So now I'm not sure what to do. It's not even 10 o'clock here in Whitby. Got to make a plan, I guess. I did my best to distract my head, first by visiting the Captain Cook Museum, and then by watching boats float under the famous swing bridge, first built in 1908. Hundred and ninety-nine steps up to Whitby Abbey. Thought we may as well go have a look. Let's get climbing. Altitude. Seventeen. Okay, I lost count. <laughs> and here is the church. The Church of St Mary's is an Anglican parish church founded in 1110 although its interior mostly dates to the 18th century. The churchyard was used as a setting for Brian Stoker's novel, Dracula, as was the nearby Whitby Abbey, a 7th century Christian monastery that later became a Benedictine Abbey. An all too common story, the Abbey and its possessions were confiscated under Henry VIII's dissolution of the monasteries. The remains though, are still used by sailors as a landmark for the coast today. So I've decided not to go into the abbey, uh, just because I literally cannot concentrate. Um, I sat there for about two hours, just trying to read and make a bit of a plan. So I know what I'm going to do if they find the camera, and I know what I'm going to do if they don't find the camera. If they don't find the camera and it doesn't work, I'm going back to my car and I'm going home. If they do find the camera and it works, then I have a plan. I'm gonna go and stay at Robin Hood's Bay tonight, so I'll get a bus there, and then I'll finish my walk from Robin Hood's Bay, and I'll still be able to get back to Helmsley in time for my car parking ticket. Um, and then I'll come back with my car and do the last sort of seven, eight mile stretch um, as a day walk. So that's basically the plan. Um, everything rests on whether they find the camera or not. Despite having a plan A, B, C, and D, I continue to sit, checking my guidebook for a few more hours as I waited for the clock to strike five. Right, it's 10 to five. I'm gonna head down to the point where the camera fell in. The scuba diver should be there about 20 past five, but I'm gonna make sure I'm very much there and we'll see how this goes. My heart was in my mouth, but upon reaching the river, I felt an upwelling of hope. Okay, I'm back where I dropped the GoPro here, and we have yellow boat, and that is Brian, the scuba diver. Oh my gosh, here they come. Come on. I could scarcely breathe as Brian disappeared into the murk below. Surfacing bubbles revealed where he was, but for a good 10 minutes, there was little to encourage me. I distracted myself by chatting to the crowd that had gathered by the railings. It seemed the whole town had come to know of my predicament. The clock was ticking, and with every minute, my brain raced with the plans that I had made. I was just about ready to go home. But then, as I let go of my last piece of hope, a miracle happened. Oh my life, you found it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> You're a legend! <laughs> oh gosh! <laughs> oh gosh! <laughs> oh. Wow! Wow! Sorry, guys. Can I just get through? Thank yeah, you. Yeah, of course. You guys are the most amazing people in my life. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah. Brian, thank you so much. <laughs> uh, oh, right, let's try it. Oh man, it worked. <laughs> this is the best day ever. That is brilliant. Oh. 
the camera work, there was a bit of water in it. Apparently there was a crab sat on top of you, but you're alive! <laughs> Wow. And that is the kindness of strangers. You've survived eight hours underwater and you're still alive. Just about. I think I might have to get you dry. <laughs> oh my gosh. Here we go, look. It's got water in the lens, as I thought might happen. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna get some food from co-op and then I'm gonna get a taxi to Argos. I'm going to buy another GoPro, which is just ridiculous. This is what I do for this whole project. Uh, and then I'm going to get to Robin Hood's Bay somehow. I'll camp at Robin Hood's Bay. Then tomorrow I'll walk just beyond Scarborough. So we've got about 18 miles. And then the final day I'll have about eight miles or something to Filey. And then I'll get back to my car before my car parking runs out. And then Friday, so a couple days time, two days time, then I'll come back here and I'll walk this last leg. So we will complete the Cleveland Way with the GoPro in tow. Let's do it. Excuse me, are you waiting for anybody? I might be able to use your services then. Yeah. Right, we need to find Argos because we're working against the taxi. Go, go, go. There it is, come on. Is that it? Ah, that's the black one. Oh, yeah. praise the Lord. Sorry, just going to be honest about how I live. <laughs> so you have that here? So we have that here today. Yeah, yes, I am. Oh, oh thanks for that. Yeah, you're a legend. Thank you so much Thank for your you help. Cheers. We have a GoPro. Come on then, let's get this taxi. Let's get this walk finished. Oh, happy days. So here we are in one of my favourite places in the whole wide world. Robin Hood's Bay is just down there. How beautiful is this land? So I'm going to pitch up, sort myself out for this evening. And tomorrow we will continue with the Cleveland Way. <laughs> what a day. I don't know what day it is now. What does yesterday count as? Does yesterday count as a day? Because if it does, then today is day six. Uh, so it's day six on the Cleveland Way. Uh, heading down into Robin Hood Bay itself now. Really quirky place, just tucked away uh, in the cliffs. Again, really interesting space. And many coaster coasters finish their journey there if they've headed uh, from the west to the east. So it's got a cool vibe and it's a special place for me. Here we are, this is where the coast to coast and the Cleveland Way sort of come down. So they come down from the cliffs and then hit this road. So we're now on the coast to coast and back on the Cleveland Way. Happy days. It is utterly magical this morning here. It's really quiet, nobody's about. And we're just dropping down into the old part of the village now, right back down by the shore. So, pretty much a year ago, this is where I stood as I finished the coast to coast walk across the country. This is the North Sea, and of course this is Robin Hood's Bay. This is a very, very special spot to me. It feels good to be back. It feels kind of strange as well to be continuing on and not putting down my pack and leaving my boots. <laughs> it's wonderful to have it so peaceful as well. Anyway, we best press on. Oh look, if you wild camped, drinking water spot. That's good, don't see that very often. Oh, and here's a part of Robin Hood's Bay I've never seen. Check that out. Wow. Right, it's time for some up. Let's get to Raven Scar, which is basically three miles of up. <laughs> One of the best things about climbing is the rewards. And it wasn't long before I was able to look down over Robin Hood's Bay 
and along the stretch of coast that I would return to walk at a later date. Good morning, horsey. God, there's a few of you guys in here. Are you friendly? You want to say hi? You're not really interested. I'm having breakfast, man. Leave me alone, will ya? Oh, hey! You are friendly. I just let me finish my breakfast. Oh, I like a good bramble to finish it off. Mmm, yum, yum. Nice. You don't know what you're missing out on, human. Brambles are good. <laughs> Up next was Boggle Hole Youth Hostel. Their cafe has a good reputation in these parts with walkers, but since I had only just eaten breakfast, I decided to walk on past. We've already had a lot of ups and downs today. It's gonna be a good one. We're probably like a mile or so in. So yeah, legs are definitely warming up, but after yesterday, I think it's about time they did some work. <laughs> oh my goodness, look at this. That's a pillbox. That's half of it. And this is the other half. It's uh, broken as the land has eroded away. Can we go in it? Actually, do I want to go in it if it's collapsing? Not really. <laughs> wow. You know, all the last night and this morning as I've been walking, all I can think about is yesterday's drama and how flipping blessed I was by the kindness of people, how friendly the fishermen were in helping me find a diver, how Brian and Steve came out and found my camera and just then sailed away. I mean, what even was that? It's unheard of. And it's just, I can't stop smiling. It was amazing. <laughs> Whoa, I got all these horsetail ferns. I have never seen so many. That is bizarre. It's obviously just the right conditions. <laughs> Incredible. Welcome to part of Ravenscar's industrial heritage. Wow, so more alum works here. Gosh, we passed a lot on this trip. Alum is a chemical compound of potassium, aluminium and sulphur, which in its natural state is a beautiful translucent crystal. It's used for dyes and up until the 16th century, Britain imported most of its alum from Italy. With the Reformation though, the country was forced to look for supplies within its borders and the industry thrived in Yorkshire right up to the mid 19th century. Leaving the mining remains behind, I reached Ravenscar which was still sleepy in the morning sun. So I passed on through without looking back. So our next point of interest is this old radar point. There's various buildings and some billboards. So when we get there, let's go explore. The site dates back to World War II and is now owned by the National Trust. Four buildings remain, a communications hut, transmitter, receiver block, fuel store, and engine house. Oh boy, we can see a long way. We can see all the way to Scarborough and just the turret there of Scarborough Castle sticking out in the haze. Oh gosh, so that's sort of my main milestone point today. I'm not gonna stop in Scarborough, I could, but I'm gonna push on beyond. Oh. All right, we got a fair odd check to get there. <laughs> look at this, look. These purple plants over there, which I can't quite reach, these are Rose Bay Willow Herb, and they're just growing out of the bracken here. Like, no way will you swamp us out. Stunning colour, so vibrant and beautiful against the blue sky. The walk along the cliff tops was absolutely brilliant, with great coastal views ahead and behind, and wildflower meadows alongside. It was tough going though, 
with plenty of ups and downs thrown in the mix. Oh wow, look at this, it goes right down. This is Hayburn Wyke. So there's a little waterfall apparently at the bottom of this. Uh, so we're descending right down to sea level and then we'll climb back up again. So this is quite a big descent and ascent. <laughs> Impressive staircase though. <laughs> is this it? This is not what I was expecting. <laughs> uh, oh, this is it down here. I can hear water, that sounds more hopeful. Oh, that's nice. More water in this one. <laughs> Purely out of interest, I dropped down to the beach, which to my surprise, revealed a magnificent waterfall tumbling down from the wike. In the heat of the day, it felt only right to go for a paddle. Ugh. Ow. So sharp. Ugh. It's like we're in a jungle now. Look at how twisted up these branches are. It's amazing space. Love it. Just like that, back on top of the cliff. Honestly, I would have descended and reclimbed twice as far as that for that special place. Absolutely loved it. Oh, cool. And there's some views back over the coast. You can see how flat it is comparative to what we've been doing. Woo! Feels good to be here. I was buzzing. Everything about this leg brought my senses to life. From the salty sea air to the ceaseless song of the skylarks alongside. This was why I loved being on foot so, so much. So we definitely reached the up and down stage now of this stretch <laughs> to just come up and down a big hail thing and now <laughs> we have another one. All right, let's do it. They're not too bad to be honest, quite enjoy it. On and on and on I walked with a light step and a calm mind. There were dramatic coastal views all around and soon I was passing by Long Nab Coast Guard Station, which was also once a mine shelter. Oh, whoa, look at all these oxide daisies. It's just this great mound of them. <laughs> look. <laughs> Love them. Scarborough was so close now and the castle ruins on the hill were more obvious than ever before. I was nervous and excited, keen to see what rounding the next corner would reveal. The tide was out, and I was more than a little tempted to do some rock pulling. But then, before I knew it, I hit solid ground, and my attention was drawn to Scarborough. We have hit concrete, and also the Sea Life Centre, so we're right on the edges of Scarborough now. So there's over 61,000 people who live here, so it's actually one of the biggest sort of holiday resort areas in Yorkshire. Uh, it's got two main beaches which as we've seen are split by the 12th century castle so we'll be skirting around the edge of that in a minute i'm just so stoked for that and uh it's just got a very sort of victorian vibe because that's when things sort of sprung up here so we'll see what we can see see if we can find the grand hotel which when it was built in the 1800s was one of the largest hotels in the world so there's lots of interesting things to find here and we'll just see what we can make of it as we head on through to be honest, I knew I wasn't going to fall in love with the town, and it certainly isn't everybody's cup of tea. A far cry from the tranquil coastal cliffs and wild natural spots I'd been walking through. That being said, I set my focus on the castle, which of course, naturally, just had to be uphill. For some reason I've chosen these steps. 
what is going on? <laughs> We've had enough of these. Obviously this incline is the natural defence for the castle. These essentially are its ramparts. I wouldn't want to be attacking, attacking in full chainmail right now. <laughs> Here we go. This is what we'd hoped for. Scarborough Castle is a former medieval royal fortress. It actually sits on the site of an old Iron Age settlement, Roman signal tower and Anglo-Scandinavian settlement and chapel, all highlighting the appeal of this prominent spot for military defences and worship practices. I decided not to pay to go in, so after a quick nosy, I headed back down to the shore, passing St Mary's Church and the grave of Anne Bronte. I was a little overwhelmed as I reached the seashore, a maze of arcades, sweet shops, and stores selling buckets and spades. It was dizzying, so instead I focused on the boats and fishing market, a hint at an industry slowly disappearing. In order to escape the town, I followed signs this way and that, finally emerging from the noise at the cliff lift, the oldest funicular cliff lift in the country. So we are out of the craziness of Scarborough, which is a relief. I just had to sort of get in the zone and figure out what I was doing and get out as quickly as possible. But time has really gone by and we have a new problem. That is my footpath. I can't walk that. So I'm trying to basically weave my way along the cliff uh, until I pick up the Cleveland Way on a higher point because right now it's inaccessible. Ah, uh, what do I do here? There's a dead end. <laughs> do not follow my example. If a rock falls on me, I take full responsibility. Oh, help, I'm stuck. How do I get out of here? Okay, that didn't work. I have to go back. I'm going to have to go all the way back into town and follow some road or something. This was not part of the plan. <laughs> Excuse me, guys. Sorry to interrupt. I'm walking the Cleveland way and I need to go that way and I'm not sure how. <laughs> Is there another way that I could yeah, take? Can you get across the sea? No, it's too rough on it. Right. Yeah, thank you so much, thank you. You go up here okay. and keep climbing to the left. As yeah. long as you're going to the left, yeah, that's all right. Up, yeah. And then you need Keep climbing to the left. Just keep climbing. <laughs> A little away from the sea now. I feel much safer on the land. Not that I was on the sea, but I could have been. Could have been in it. Feels like we're going right down to the sea. And that is not what I want. See if I can see from here rather than having to get... Ah, no, that's okay. We're okay. Oh, we're okay. That's what we want. Chalk path. Follow that and we can get back up. Happy days. I don't enjoy losing the comfort of the trail. <laughs> uh, that's my little comfort zone, actually. Just being like plodding along, following the acorns. All good. Happy days. All right, let's try and pick it back up again. I don't know if this is actually it or not, but hopefully at the top of the cliff we'll be reunited with the Cleveland Way and we can continue along our way. <laughs> oh my gosh, look, finally, seven and a half miles. If I really wanted to, I could push for that, but I kind of don't. I'd like to finish tomorrow morning when it's all quiet and nice on the top of the brig, I think. 
that always happens when I see a sign with single digits to the end. I can't believe we're seven and a half miles from Filey. I feel absolutely physically fit enough to take that on, but it's gone half past five and I don't think that's very sensible. Um, even though the lighting is beautiful, it's quite harsh in the mornings here. From here, the way led me to the edge of Osgoodby, where I left the trail in search of a campsite. Okay, so this is Osgoodby Lane. So I'm gonna head down here. The Cleveland Way continues that way. So I'm leaving the way. We'll come back up here tomorrow or slightly further up. We're going this way and this will take us all the way down to Caton and the campsite. That evening, I managed to secure a pitch at a campsite in Caton, where I crashed out, eagerly anticipating my final day along the way. So this is it, we've rejoined the Cleveland Way. Uh, so we're back on the trail now. Let's follow this all the way to Filey. I think it's about six miles maybe. Whatever it is, we're going to do it and we're going to make the most of this. Enjoy this last little stretch on the Cleveland Way today. The sky was bright and the sea glary as the sun bounced off its surface. With high winds though, there were plenty of waves, so the surfers were out in full force. I pressed on along the cliffs, walking slowly and savouring every step. The path gently rose and soon I was able to look back over the lands through which I had travelled. Currently we're just climbing up to the Blue Dolphin Holiday Park. It's flipping massive, so we've got to walk alongside it for a fair stretch. Here we go. How many caravans are there? <laughs> Quite a lot. At least it is just a case of staying around the edge of it. You want to be sandwiched between the sea and the caravans. But speaking of the sea, I think I've spotted a seal down there. I can't really tell from up here. Maybe it's just its head above the water. We've still got about an hour's worth of walking to go to Filey, but I'm really starting to feel the anticipation. I'm having to watch my headspace because it's jumping forwards to the finish. And that means I won't be living in this moment, the last steps as best as I can. And that's what I really want to do is to soak up these last few miles on the trail and just enjoy them, embrace them. And then I'll have them to remember and treasure for a long time to come. I was so close now, with the sea on my left and the outskirts of Filey on my right, my heart was in my mouth. I could scarcely believe that the end of the way was nearly in sight, and my mind raced with memories that I had accumulated over the hundred miles behind me. And then, there it was, the end of the trail. <laughs> Helmsley, 109 miles. Oh. We've made it. This is it. So we're standing on top of the natural peninsula, this narrow peninsula called Filey Brig, just above the town of Filey. And this is where the end of the Cleveland Way sits. It's also the beginning of the Yorkshire Wilds Way, but I'm more tempted, to be honest, to just turn around and rewalk the Cleveland Way, just head back to Helmsley on foot. But all my life, what a journey it has been. It has blown my mind. Every single day has just been peppered with spectacular historical and archaeological sites, geographical features, geological marvels. I found fossils, I've enjoyed heather, I've seen red grouse. And then of course, we hit the coast. And I had no idea what to expect with the coast, but it certainly was undulating. But my personal highlights were stays, and we headed down into the cliffs, and then there's this settlement just hugged and curtained by the rock. And then there was the Hayburn Wyke with the waterfall, and of course that beach crossing and heading up the waterfall to go up the steps and up the cliff down by, uh, where was that even near? Uh, Runswick Bank Top, that's where it was. Gosh, all those days ago. And here we are, do you recognize this? This is a mirrored seat, similar to the one we left at Helmsley all those days ago. Oh, we've made it. What a fantastic feeling that is and what a great place to finish. 
but actually just that last five miles as I was walking I found it quite hard to get out of my tent this morning but that's one thing you've always got to do is just keep getting out of your tent keep putting one foot in front of the other but I was thinking about the uh the, the sort of lessons that I learned towards the beginning of the trail straight away just being reminded that I'm stronger than I think that we are stronger than we think if we're willing as a human species to put aside the limitations and the boundaries that perhaps society or people we know or even ourselves have put on top of ourselves then we just release ourselves into this immense potential we can just go so far with our bodies and our minds we're capable of so much but we just have to believe it and grab hold of that belief and stay true to that belief so thank you guys for journeying with me but you might be thinking hang on Abby you're not quite done yet and you're not wrong there so I'm basically going to finish up here and just faff around for the rest of the day and then tomorrow morning I'm going to get back to Whitby and I'm going to walk the stretch from Whitby to Robin Hood's Bay and that will conclude my Cleveland Way walk the walk down into Filey took me past St Oddwell's church and then down to the seafront itself. I basked in the feeling of fulfilment, but didn't allow myself to stop for too long. I had a long journey to get back to Helmsley. I am in Whitby, it is the next day, and we're gonna head on and walk that final stretch of the coastal path to Robin Hood's Bay. So I'm gonna head up the 199 steps, I'm gonna go past the Abbey, and then we'll pick up the Cleveland Way along the tops of the cliffs. Now I've been reading about this stretch in my guidebook, and apparently it is gorgeous, but quite strenuous. Uh, but we've got this overcast day today, so hopefully it'll just be really, really enjoyable. And then I have a six hour drive home, so. <laughs> I'm not going to rush this. <laughs> Here's the steps. Once again, up we go. <laughs> oh I love how the higher you climb, the better the views are over the town. You can see all along the river and along the coast that we've walked. As we know, it's better from the top. Here we go then, Robin Hood's Bay, six and a half miles. I began the walk along the cliff tops by entering a caravan park and then passing the Scar and Saltwick Nab, with more mining works tumbling down into the sea. For the first time, I spotted seabirds nesting in the cliffs. It was a fulfilling sight and their calls pulsed through the air like electric. A little further along the coast was Highlights Lighthouse and Hornblower Lodge, built in the 1900s and still in use today. Wow, the views along the coast here are pretty spectacular. You can see for miles. Oh yes, I love these. <laughs> There's not a lot left. So it's good fun. <laughs> Onwards and upwards. Robin Hood's Bay, three miles. Whitby, three and a half. Nice one, so we're halfway for our little leg today. All it takes is a little bit of water and you get all of this life with the trees and then the birds and then the bugs and then the butterflies. It really is fantastic. These little oasis that you drop down into if oasis is, is a word. <laughs> Here we go then, now we're talking. So we have officially rejoined the coast to coast path. This is it. So it comes down through the caravan park up there and you emerge to these dramatic coastal views here, looking right back over the land that we've just walked through. But also I just noticed the last few miles and I stumble upon my favourite flower of all time. It's my screensaver on my phone. I've got it on my wall at home. Oh, I love these. These, my friends, are harebells. Really delicate little purple flowers. You often find them up on the moors and I absolutely adore them. They're paper thin and yet they're so vibrant and they thrive in such harsh environments. What a pleasure to find these here. 
The final leg saw me swimming in a feeling of satisfaction, and I took my time, embracing the atmosphere of freedom that only backpacking can really offer. And then, there it was, Robin Hood's Bay, a sprawl of buildings cascading down the cliffs to the ocean below. I had made it. I had completed the entire Cleveland Way walk. <laughs> so here we are. This is Robin Hood's Bay and the top of Robin Hood's Bay. Of course, that's the way the Cleveland Way goes. We've just waved goodbye and now I'm heading up to the campsite. That's it, we're done. We've finished the Cleveland Way. We've walked every mile and trekked out every leg. And what an experience it has been. Thank you so much for following my journey. I hope you have enjoyed it as much as I have. And perhaps you've been inspired to plan your own trips, your own adventures, and to get outside and spend more time in the wild. So, you know the drill. When you get out, enjoy those adventures and stay wild. Oh, and don't go dropping your camera in the river or in any ocean. <laughs> it's a big hassle trying to get it out. <laughs> Oh, squeaky. Oh. <laughs>